Okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit for this lab session on writing grants. Okay, so if you decided that you're gonna write a grant that's good, you're already in the top like percentage of students. That's amazing. Um, know that it's your responsibility to finish the grant. That's kind of like the, the limiting factor is there are many, many, many times where I say, oh, I'm gonna write this grant, I'm gonna write a grant. And really, really the limiting thing is like, can you finish it or not? So, and it's up to you to finish it. Nobody else will finish it for you, especially if you're a student. Like you might get a PI who's willing to like help you out, they're not gonna write it for you, okay? So like if you wanna get a grant, you have to write it and finish it. So know that it's your responsibility. Um, okay, so before you start, like things to know about the process about writing grants. Um, <laughs> I have funny thoughts, okay. Um, the people who get grants are not necessarily the people who deserve them. Um, and the people who deserve them usually don't get them. So just know like there's a lot of weird things about writing grants. Um, one example of this is you will find people in science that if you look at their CV or their resume, they will have like, like a giant list of things that they've accomplished, quote unquote, or like publications. Like if, if you look at people's publications, you'll find some insane people who have like a whole bunch of publications. Now the gist is they clearly were not really the person driving all of those publications, okay? You have to look at the denominator of time. And so it's people like this are often people who get grants because their resumes look really good. But they're not necessarily the best intellectual drivers. You can look at some other people's resumes and they might have one, two, three, but maybe they're the first author on everything that they've done. And maybe they're the per, really the person responsible for finishing these projects. These are the people who in a just world should get grants because they're the people who are driving research. But oftentimes the people who do are, are people with resumes like this. So it's like that. Um, you hope that reviewers can look at people's resumes and decide and figure out who is driving research and who is not, but it commonly does not happen. So just, just know that. So in that scenario, I mean, as a, starting faculty member or even a postdoc that's trying to start writing grants, I mean, that's almost like a, a barrier. <laughs> it's, oh, it's for sure a barrier. Yeah, it's like, yes, it's definitely. The average age of when people get their first R01, which is the NIH, the big NIH grant, the average age is something like 40 to 45. Like, that's how old you are when you get your first, like, big grant. Um, so they're essentially, like, already, like, Probably, perhaps, probably at the peak of their career, but they're 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 late into their career. You, um, it's very difficult for young people to get grants. With that said, there are mechanisms that specifically fund younger people. So it's very important to look at what grant are you applying for. Who are you competing with? Like you're not going to get an R O one. You're not going to get that. But if you apply for perhaps like a, a, a master's fellowship or a PhD fellowship. Now you're competing against other young individuals who are at that same point in their career. You know what I mean? So yeah, you don't want to be competing against like the monsters of the field when you are young, sort of like up and comer. Although that's what we have to do. That's like what I kind of like am trying to do right now. Uh, it's a tough struggle, but hey, don't feel sorry for me. I'm having fun. Um, okay, and also the grant that you think is good is not necessarily the grant that reviewers think are good. So understand that you are sending your grant into a process where you get a panel of reviewers, and I'm gonna talk about these panels, um, and they're gonna essentially be the ones looking at your grant, and it's what they think. So you have to know your audience and who you are writing to, and this is gonna dictate what you write, and it's gonna be vastly different for different panels, different governmental organizations, like the style in which you would write a grant 
would be totally different. So for instance, if I'm writing the grant to the NIH vector biology panel, I'm gonna phrase that differently than I would to an NSF or a USDA grant. It's different, you have to know your audience. Um, okay, a couple other things. The only way to ensure that you're getting grants, so you can decide, like I'm gonna decide right now that I'm gonna get a grant, and you can make that work. The only thing that is like, again, the factor is like will to power, what I just talked about, like your will, you have to just submit over and over and over and over relentlessly. And if you submit about 10 grants um, and you get one, so 10 to get one, that's pretty average. That's about what I get. So essentially, the, the positive thing is if you submitted a grant and you didn't get it, it's not that you're a bad grant writer, it's not that you're doomed to fail, it's that like you haven't hit enough. I would not conclude that you're a bad grant writer unless you've submitted at least 10 to 15 grants. And if you didn't get any of them at that point, then I'd be like, okay, maybe you should think about doing something different. Um, Are you allowed to mention that the same one? Yes, I'm gonna get to that. Yes. So that, that's a key thing. Um, but I'm gonna get to that in a second. Okay, so also know that the the success rate is 10, is essentially like, it's 10%. This is true at NIH. You can find weird situations where it's higher than that, but, but know that that is the funding rate, okay? So there's just literally just not enough funding in science. I wish that like uh, scientific funding was like as funded as like sports or something like that, but it's not. Um, and so just know that if you want to get a grant, again, you have to hit the high numbers because nothing you can do can overcome that 10% funding rate. They literally have to decide, okay, I have 10 grants, nine, nine we gotta throw away. And if anybody has any questions, just shout them out. Okay. So the three most important things that I think, oh, I should also say, careful who you listen to, I have like a mixed record of getting grants. I've gotten two kind of like big grants from USDA and the state of Alabama. I haven't yet gotten NIH funding. I haven't yet gotten NSF funding. So perhaps take what I say with a grain of salt. I've got some grants, but I'm definitely not by any means like the world's number one record producing grant writer. Um, okay, so a couple things you need for grants. Uh, a good novel idea. And I really mean it with the novelty when you submit to grants to anywhere, NSF, USDA, NIH, you will be graded on novelty. They will literally get a rubric and they will be asked a question, how novel is this? Okay, that means like, are you doing new things that nobody's done before? Now it's a catch 22. It's a catch 22, right? Because if you really propose novel research, they will never fund you because they'll think you're crazy and they'll think like nobody can do this. Like that's what I was saying, nobody will believe you. Like that's what will happen. So it's very difficult. You have to balance. You have to have a really good idea and it has to be novel in the sense that like nobody's done it, but you can't make it sound impossible, okay? Or you will never get, you will never get funded. Um, and I kind of, again, I showed you at least how to get good ideas. So we kind of have a foundational framework for how to generate good ideas. That's a starting point, okay? Second thing you need if you ever wanna get funded it is massive preliminary data. This is the joke with submitting grants, is you can't get a grant unless you've already done all the work. That's literally like the joke. Uh, and the only gigantic grant that I got, I literally had done most of it already before. And you submit, the way that you do this, it sounds like it's, it's crazy. This is the way that it is though. You do the work and then you submit the grant and you say, I'm gonna do all these things and then you submit your data that you've already figured out as quote unquote preliminary data. And then none of the reviewers can look at that and say, this is impossible, it can't be done because you have the data showing like it's already been done. Um, and most people get grants and use that funding to generate sort of like new projects. It's sad, but most people have already done all the work to get, um, to get funded. Now, the catch is if you are applying for like a fellowship, that's not gonna be, that's not gonna be true. 
Um, depending on, again, where you are in your career, they're gonna expect different things. But know that preliminary data is kind of like the number one big thing. Like if you submit a grant and you, can, and you say, I'm gonna do X, I'm gonna do this, they're gonna say, he doesn't have any experience doing X, right? So the only way that you can beat that criticism is by either having it already done or having some kind of publication already like in the field or having a giant piece of preliminary data that says like, I'm already working on this. Like, here's the data. Okay. I think this has been the number one thing for when I get funded, it's been this. You have preliminary data. And what oftentimes people will do is they'll publish a series of papers. I've literally seen this. They'll publish a series of papers and you might think, oh, because it's already published, it's no longer like preliminary data. No, that's not true. They will take data from their previous publications and they will put it in their grant as preliminary data, even though it's not quote unquote preliminary data, it's published data. Like I've seen people do that and they do that. Is that, I mean, illegal? Is there? Is no, that, there's um, no, there's no rules against that. Okay. I mean, and I, like I have mixed feelings about it. It kind of makes sense. Like um, if somebody has been working on something for years, like they're probably a good person to do the research, right? So why should they not be able to include work that they've done? Why just because it's been published, why should it not be included in my preliminary data? Like some of these studies you will initiate because specifically you need preliminary data. So for example, for me, some of these studies I started because I needed preliminary data for a project. I got it, I just didn't get the grant. And then I published the paper and then I kept trying to get the grant. So like, it's legal, you can do that. And like you said, you, I mean, oftentimes they use the money to answer different questions since they already have So you have to be careful. You definitely cannot ethically write a grant and say like, um, like I'm gonna do exactly what I've already done. You, you yeah. can't do that. But again, science is kind of like, it's like a branched tree. And if you answer one question, that's not the end. It just means now there's more questions for you to answer. Success just means you have more work. So oftentimes you will write a grant around premise A, and premise A would have been your first like original grant that you completed, and now you're like, okay, this, is, this part's completed, but I could expand the research to X, Y, and Z. And so in the aims, you might have these as your aims with this as your preliminary data. Does that make sense? Yeah. But this might have been the biggest hill that you've already overcome and everything else is already downhill from here. And that's what they want to see because from their perspective, they're trying to fund something they're gonna, that's not risky. That's kind of like how they think about it, which is a shame because really the only research worth doing is risky research. Um, but that's the way that it is. The third thing, which you can't really do anything about, especially if you're early career, is name recognition and reputation. Um, this is important, like I wish it wasn't, but it is. And in situations where, so here's an example of this. I know somebody, um, let's call them person X. Person X has written ghost grants, so he was a ghost writer, writing big gigantic R01 NIH grants for person Z, okay? So he writes, say like R01, for person Z, a second R01 for person Z, and he submits these grants under um, the employment of person Z, and the only thing, he writes the entire grant, the only thing he does is he puts Z as the author, submits the grant, and it gets funded. And then person X starts his own lab and submits grants and perpetually gets shot down every single time. This is a true situation that happens. So, like, Name recognition is important. Um, and I say this so that if there's ever a situation where you can find somebody who can be your mentor and they have the name recognition, that can help you. Like I'm just being honest, that can help you. So um, you might consider like, who could I collaborate with or who could I loop into this project to help my chances of success? That's a common thing to do. Okay, so this was the um, 
the question about the resubmissions. So the other thing is, I said their 10% funding rate, but yes, know that most people, most people never get funded their first submission, and most people will write a grant, and they'll submit a grant, it'll get sent back by the reviewers, the reviewers will have a list of comments, sometimes you can address the comments, resubmit, and then you have a much better shot. So like at the NIH, they know when the grants come in, is this a first try or a second try? And they're kind of operating practice, they won't say this, but their operating practice is kind of traditionally to reject all first time grants. Um, it's almost like also too, like you find this sometimes in medical schools where you apply, they can reject people first try to see who is persistent and comes back second round. Um, again, they won't say this as explicit policy, but grant panels are people and people have their own biases and oftentimes they will do this because oftentimes in their minds, again, this is not my opinion or whether this is ethical or not, this is what I think happens. Oftentimes people who sit on the panels, they have a list of people that they have seen applying to that panel over and over and over and they will think, okay, it's this person's turn. It's this person's turn now and then that one will get funded. Again, I don't think that's ethical. I'm not in charge, but I think that that happens. So if you're persistent, the, 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 the lesson is if you are persistent, you're more likely to get funded. Also, your name is now recognized because they see you and they think, oh, this person, I saw them last round. They've applied. They've applied before and they fixed some of my issues. The downside of this is oftentimes they say, fix these issues, you fix the issues and you resubmit it. And then they give you a list of new issues and they say, these ones, nobody actually cared about those in the first place, uh, whatever, blah, 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 blah. That's happened to me many times before. So it's kind of like uh, a game of luck. Uh, I know with the, some of the grants for students, if you submit it while you're in undergrad, uh, they will, the panel will resend you back something with comments and stuff mm -hmm. and also allow you to send it a second time yeah. straight to them. Those are good grants to apply for because then if it's 10%, at least then it's, uh, you have kind of like a 20% chance if you can submit it twice. Okay. Um, okay, let's talk about the review process. So a couple of things to know about your reviewers. You'll know that I have a very jaded uh, view of this process. The reviewers that are gonna be reviewing your grant are gonna be unqualified. Um, they're gonna be biased. They're gonna be unprepared. And in some cases, they will literally be stupid and they'll be overworked. And this is true. I've been on grant panels before. I've served at the NIH before. My impression when I served on the NIH panel was that this was a bunch of stupid people who are overworked and none of them even read the grants before they got there. I was like one of the few who had actually read my assignments. And you can imagine, you can imagine how this happens. Professors are already kind of like at their maximum for like work that they're already doing. And all of a sudden you send a professor a giant stack of 25, 25 page grants and you say, oh, read these in a week, figure out like which one is good, which one is bad. You can tell how that's already gonna lead to something like this, okay? And the only people who have time to do that are unqualified people who aren't very good and so they don't have very much work because they don't have a whole bunch of like projects to be poor. Now that's, that's not always true, like you can definitely look at the panels and you can say people are qualified for sure. Um, but in some cases that's true where sometimes the people reviewing your grant literally like should not be reviewing it at all. Like they're just literally like not within the realm of expertise. And when you get into science, you start to specialize so highly, like it's kind of ridiculous to assume that there's other people on the planet who can understand your research as well as you do. It's, it's, it's not always true that that can happen. So do you, you get or can you get on there? It's a mix. You can get on. So it's, it's, wait, what? Does that kind of give you end recognition? 
Yes, so that's that's a strategy for what people will do is on some of these you can quote unquote volunteer. Um, you can volunteer and you can get on the panel and then you kind of like get, yeah, like a, a mindset of, okay, this is what it's really like in the panel. So some programs like the NIH will have like a early investigator um, program where they bring early investigators to see what the process is like and invite them to be on the panel. In other panels, you can apply. You can apply to be on the USDA panel. You can apply to be on the NSF panel. And then they will just essentially like pull you. Um, and, and that's good to do. Like grant writers will tell you like, um, until you do that, you're kind of like not even in the pool. Cause then once you do that, then people who are on the panel know who you are. And like they say, oh, I've seen this person before. Like I know who they are. So that can definitely help. Like that's a good strategy. Okay, the other, the other scenario. So this is scenario one. The other scenario is the only person on the planet who's qualified to review your work is your biggest competitor. So the other scenario is they recruit the competitor who hates you uh, to review your grant, okay? This is the other non-good non scenario. Um, and just know that like there will be situations where perhaps you are not at this stage in your career yet, but you might be reviewed by somebody who literally doesn't like you, or they literally don't like your work, or you're actually competing directly with them for funding. And if you don't think that they will reject your grant just because of that, you're naive, okay? It's, again, it's human people who are reviewing your grants. And the thing about thinking fast and slow is they will reject your grant and think that they did it for rational reasons when in reality they just rejected it because they didn't like you and they sort of like got this decision in their brain thought out uh, and explained it to themselves as through rational processes. So okay. Same thing with uh, when you were, have reviewers for publishing yes. papers. Yes, it is exactly the same, which is why I don't like anonymous review. Um, also be aware if you do have, and I, so this would be only for certain contexts, but they will steal your ideas. Um, so if this is a concern for you, if you are a person who's working on something that is really cutting edge and you are actually worried about you, some situations like people are paranoid and, and you have to ask yourself, do people really care about this? Will they really steal it? And in most cases, like no. But if you are actually working on something that is cutting edge, you have to understand that there's millions of dollars on the line and people will steal that in an instant. So you might have to strategically perhaps wait if you're working on something, again, wait until it's like already done so that you're kind of safe and then submit. It's gonna depend on the situation. Some situations are not gonna be like that, but don't be naive, they, they will do that. Did you say copyright? There, there are situations where if you are working on um, something that's quote unquote patentable, you can, you can like uh, black it out. Um, but just know that if you do that, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Cause like you're saying, you're telling the reviewer, here are the key details. Uh, I'm not gonna let you see what they are. Um, like you're, it's not, it's not the best practice to do that, but you can do that to protect yourself. But if you, I would say if you did that, probably not as likely you're gonna get the grant. But no, because in order for them to review your ideas, like you have to tell them what the ideas are. So like there's legally, like legally they're not allowed to, to do that, but that doesn't stop people. Uh, it, it for sure it doesn't. And Essentially, like, like the, now, okay, so, so there's, there's rules. Well, actually kind of yes, because if you get the grant it's, and it's federal dollars, they can, people can file a Freedom of Information Act and get their grant. And companies will do that to see what people are working on. And even universities do that to see what their competitors are working on. So any grant that's been funded is under control of Freedom of Information Act. So they can, they can request that and get that. Yes, if you've already published it, then like, then like you're good. But if you've already published it, then again, you've shot yourself in the foot because then you're proposing something that's already been done. So your reviewers will be like, but you already did this, it's published. But so- I've got another question. What? I've got another question. Okay. No, I'm 
Oh, yeah, yeah. See, that's 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 what they try to do. But again, it's a fine line. Like, that's it's a fine line that you know, if you're if you're thinking about like work and like impact, there's going to be like at some point there's going to be like a peak impact to your study, and if you publish that. Everything else from then on is kind of like, well, we've already solved kind of like the main problem. So it's harder to justify the research, like when it's on when it's on the downswing, than it is to justify it when it's here. But when it's right here is when it's in most danger of being stolen. So yeah, like it's hard. It's not it's not an easy thing to figure out. I had a botany professor that found a new species of like fern or spleenwort and he would not tell us what it was until he published the paper, like he refused. Yeah. It's, it's actually like a common thing um, in science. Don't doubt it, because it is. People are people. So, knowing your audience. In some cases, you can figure out who is on the panel. So for NIH, you can, you can see what's called the panel roster. You can download the roster, you can see who's on it. And smart people download that roster, they read those people's publications, and they cite those people <laughs> because they're essentially like kissing their ass, like saying, like letting them know that they know who they are. Okay, that's probably a smart thing to do. Other cases you don't know. So like at NSF, um, the panels are anonymous. I think this is still true. And USDA, I think they're anonymous. So at least NIH, like, at least NIH, there's some accountability. You can see who's there. If it's anonymous, like, your review is literally, like, I tell people this is like Russian roulette. You could write the best grant in the world. Doesn't mean you're going to get it. You fill a gun with six bullets, you spin it, and you hope that you get the one chamber that's empty. That's literally what uh, peer review in grant panels is like. You also have to understand, in terms of like audience context, you also have to understand the, your field, um, kind of like field biases. So in, for example, in my field of like medical entomology, there's kind of like old school and there's kind of like new school. And you can imagine how the old school people don't like the research of the new schoolers and the new school people don't like the research of the old schools. So you have to look at the panel and you have to see like, okay, like where does this fit into the field and what am I proposing? And again, the thing that you think should be funded is not necessarily what they think should be funded. So you have to write to your audience if you want any chance or just submit so many times as you get lucky, which is what I do. <laughs> okay, so how to start. Like knowing that that's the process, like it sucks, but again, life sucks, deal with it. Uh, like if you decide I'm gonna get a grant, you, then you, at some point you just decide, okay, I'm gonna start. How do you start? So the first thing is you have to find a grant. And this is the this is actually like the hardest part, finding a grant. And by that I mean there's a couple different ways you can go about this. Um, so there's the usuals like NIH, USDA, NSF. If you were doing perhaps like um, bioengineering, maybe you would go like Department of Defense or like uh, Department of Energy, DOE. Like there's gonna be like a set of kind of like, where do most people in my field get their grants? That's a good starting point. So all these divisions are gonna have different, a whole bunch of different types of grants and they're gonna be given some strange number. Like at the NIH, there's gonna be R01s, which are big renewable um, research projects that last for five years that are about $1.25 million. There's also R21s, the R21, the purpose of it is supposed to be to generate preliminary data for an R01 application. So like there's different funding mechanisms and there's gonna be fellowships. So a young student, you're gonna to wanna to look at the fellowships. And in the fellowships, there's gonna be masters, there's gonna be like undergraduate research, 
there's going to be like a PhD fellowship and there's going to be postdocs, postdoctoral fellowships. Okay. So you have to figure out like which one are you on track for, target that. And know that these different mechanisms do have different funding rates. So certain postdoc fellowships at the NIH are even less than 10%. If you go to the USDA and you apply for a master's fellowship, sometimes it gets up to 50% funding rates. So some of these are like less applied for than others that might be worth looking into. Okay, so pick one of these and know that if you write kind of like the skeletal structure for one of these, you can probably take that structural grant and adapt it for multiple organizations. So some people will throw in applications to a couple different things. And on your application, the only thing you need to do is list, oh, I've also applied for this thing and this thing. And it's not gonna hurt you as long as you like list it. So you can apply for multiple things. And that's how some people, again, get game the system in a sense that they get a better chance because they're applying for multiple grants with kind of like the same idea. Okay, so find a grant. That's the limiting reagent. It's actually kind of hard. But if you know where to look, another good place to look is um, mine CVs. So a lot of people will post their CVs online, download their CV. There'll be a section called grants and awards. Look at what those people got. Look at what those grants they got. Apply for those grants. And this is how you find grants from like private institutions and things like that. It's not just the big three that have grants. It's also a bunch of private fellowships and things like that. But it's harder to find those. You can find them by looking at people's CVs. Okay. Two, once you find a grant, find the due date. I really mean it. The hardest thing to submit in your grant is finding a grant that hasn't had the due date passed yet, okay? So find the due date and know that most of these grants, it's gonna take about probably like three months process to apply for it. You might be able to write it in a week, but figuring sort of out details and stuff might take an extra month. So you wanna look for something where hopefully you have at least three months to process before it's due. Okay. Three, check to see if you qualify. Okay. Um, again, there's gonna be all kinds of different grants. Some grants are gonna be specifically for minorities. Some grants are gonna be specifically for a certain gender. Some grants are gonna be specifically for, um, I don't know, X, Y, Z, okay? You have to check to see that you qualify and that's gonna be in the instructions. So the fourth step is find the instructions. So this is gonna be a nightmare, but it's something you have to go through if you wanna do it. Once you find the instructions, what's gonna happen is you'll probably find a couple PDFs and these PDFs will be like 80 pages long. They're gonna be like insane PDFs and you're gonna open this up and the first thing you're gonna think is, my God, I could never like figure this out. That's literally what you're gonna think, but if you take it slow, you can, you can figure it out, okay? And there's probably gonna be a couple different ones. You're probably gonna find one PDF and a second PDF and maybe a third PDF, and they're all gonna be purportedly the instructions for this grant that you're trying to apply for. Okay, then when you're in that situation, you have to look through the three, find the places where they converge, or try to figure out which one of these is the correct one, um, and follow those instructions. One way you can get around this is, usually there's a contact for the grant called the program director or the program officer, and usually that will be listed in the instructions or on the website where you found the instructions. You can send that person an email or you can call them on the phone and that's actually a suggested thing, it's a good thing because you say, hey, I'm thinking of applying for this grant. This is my particular idea. Do you think this is something worth sending in? Contact those person, figure out which of the instructions is the right one, okay? And then you're on the right track. 
Okay. Five. The next thing I do is I immediately assemble a list of required documents. Okay. So the reason that this is going to be intimidating is because this is going to be a giant 80 page pamphlet. And within this is going to be subheadings. And each of these subheadings is going to be the instructions for a particular document. So know when you write a grant, you don't just write one document. You're usually writing about eight to 12 documents. Okay. There's separate documents with separate functions. Okay. So some of the things you might find, some of the things you might find are specific aims, research strategy, biosketch, or CV, environment, mentorship plan, um, facilities, and equipment, budget, etc. And like I said, there's going to be a list of like eight to 12 documents. Each of these is going to be required to be written separately. And each of these is going to be required to have a separate document. So assemble a list of all these things that you need. Okay. And then once you have the list, you need to find the format instructions. So every one of these grants is going to say, oh, something like 11 size font, 0.5 margin, single spaced, blah, 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 blah. Once you know the formatting, set up a word file for every one of these documents under that format. Then you at least have like a list. Okay. If I just do this and this and this, um, I'm closer to being done. And then you have a list of all the enumerated things you need to submit the grant. Okay. Once you get here, it's a lot less intimidating. The most intimidating step is trying to figure out from the instructions what this list is. That's literally the most intimidating step. Once you have this, you can start to visualize, okay, like I know how to write an essay about myself. I know how to write an essay about the research strategy. I know how to write an essay about mentorship. Okay. But getting this list is sort of the part where you go from unknown to now it's known. That's the hard part. And once you've done this once, you'll never forget it. And most grants are similar. So doing this once is, is very Priority. beneficial. What? Priority. What'd you say? It said doing this once scars you. Oh, it does scar you. Yeah. <laughs> it will be forever scarred in your mind. Um, okay. And then from there, you just start writing each document. I would start with the specific game. Okay, so let's talk about that, which is why I'm asking you guys for your projects to write a specific aims so you know how to address that. Okay, so let's talk about specific aims. So specific aims is your cover sheet? Is the what? Specific aims is your cover sheet? Cover page? No, there will also be a cover page. But not not that cover page is usually cover page is usually something where there's usually like you put your title. There's usually like a bunch of numbers and stuff you don't understand that is like going to some bureaucrat bureaucracy that tells them to send X Y Z. And then usually on the cover page you can ask to include or exclude certain reviewers. So if you're really worried about somebody on the cover page, you can say, please don't have this person review my grant because of this reason. And sometimes they'll listen to you, sometimes they won't. Um, you don't get to decide, but you can ask for it. So that's oftentimes what cover page is used for. But the specific aims is the most important document because this is how it works. So the panel will assemble, so there'll be a panel. And the first thing that the program director will do is he will send out every specific aim from all the grants. He'll take out that document 
and he will send every panel member essentially like a giant document that has all the specific games. Okay. And what happened in my case was the project director essentially said, or not the project director, the program director, essentially said like, okay, everybody look through this, look through all these specific games, try to get an idea of what needs to be triaged and what needs to be thrown away. So imagine if there's like 50 grants. Triage means your grant was so unworthy they decided not even to read it, okay? That, that, that's usually what happens. I've had many grants triaged. It doesn't mean that your grant's bad. It literally just means you, had a, you got a bad round of the specific games, okay? And people will literally like take this list of the specific games, go sit in the bathtub and look at the titles and then already immediately decide, okay, what gets triaged, what's not, without even reading the rest of your grant. That will happen. So the specific games is the most important thing you will write. It needs to have some kind of a hook that is gonna like make the person see there's value in this grant. Okay, and there's no, there's no like magic formula for that. Like if there was a magic formula, it'd be a lot easier to get grants. It's, there's no magic formula because it's randomized depending on who your reviewers or your audience is. Um, okay, so what goes into the specific games? Usually there's like a paragraph, the first paragraph is like my idea. Like usually you start with there and usually that means like there's a problem. There's a problem, like here's my idea, I'm gonna fix like that problem. So you already have to, you have to figure out some way to hook them like right away on the idea that this research is valuable, okay? And then usually there's a segment of like background information, which is kind of like, okay, now that I got you hooked that my idea is important, here's all the background information you need to know. Of course, it's not all the background information you need to know. Here's kind of like the main bits that a lay person would need to know, okay? And then usually it's a segment of, here's precisely what I'm gonna do in the most succinct language that is as scientifically accurate and rigorous as I can do without making it complicated to read. And usually people have three specific games, although not necessarily. I've submitted a grant with one specific game, which almost got funded, and I've submitted grants with three or four specific games, okay? And here's where you list like, here's what I'm gonna do, here's what I'm gonna do, here's what I'm gonna do. And this is what I was saying where Remember how, like, if your idea is A, like that goes up here, and then your specific games are like, here's a branch, here's a branch, here's a branch. Hopefully, um, hopefully the reviewers can see why all these branches are worth pursuing. What you worry about is, here's one thing that they look for that's a problem, is if A suggests specific in X, and then if you complete X, you can do specific game Y. And if you complete Y, you can do Z. This is a problem for them because they'll say, well, what if you don't complete X? Now you're screwed. So this structure is sort of like better because X doesn't depend on Y, Y doesn't depend on Z. And so you can get something where if X fails, at least I still get two and three. It's kind of like trying to build in redundancy. Okay, that's the gist of specific games. I also like to do a figure, like a small figure in specific games. Some people do not like to do that. I haven't figured out the formula yet. As a reviewer, I like to see figures. I don't like to see grants that are just endless text. To me, that's a nightmare. Um, and also some figures are nightmares. Some figures are like, just a figure with like more, <laughs> more stuff. As a reviewer, I like to see something, a figure should like simplify. Should, I should be able to look at this, what's the idea? Like make it, figures should essentially allow you to say more without having to write it. That's what a good figure would do. But like I said, I haven't figured out the pattern. Some reviewers hate figures. Some reviewers like the figures. Some, re some reviewers are like easily wowed by like complicated data and some reviewers are smarter and they're like, 
this doesn't make any sense, blah, 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 blah. I haven't figured it out. Okay, and then the other big component that you have to write is the research strategy, usually. So this is essentially, this is usually the biggest document. So the specific aims would usually be about one page. For a fellowship, this is probably three to six pages. For an R1, this is something like, I can't remember if it's 12, 12 pages, single space, something like that. USDA grants are bigger, they're like 20 pages. This is the big thing, okay? This is where you say, this is now where you spend a couple pages on background, giving everything that needs to be known. This is where now you dissect every single aim and you say specifically, here's precisely how I'm gonna do this. These are the model systems I'm gonna use. This is the experiment I'm gonna use. This is my positive control. This is my negative control. This is the data that I expect to get. This is the problems that I expect to encounter. Here's what I'm gonna do if I encounter those problems. Blah, 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 blah. They'll give you a list of things that they want in this. And what people have told me is probably good, probably good heuristic, which is usually they'll give you a list of everything they want and literally just bullet point that list and follow the list, okay? You wanna make it easy for the reviewer to grade your grant. And usually the way that they grade these is they're given a rubric And the rubric matches the bullets. So if you arrange your grant like the bullets, they can literally just go through and like do it. But that is not always the case. Some grants are literally just like, like it's, it's too hard to do that. Um, but a good heuristic is to try to follow precisely the organization of the rubric instructions that they give you in the instructional formula. Once you got the research strategy, you're, you're over the hill, okay? Like research strategies up here, everything else is downhill. Everything else is easy. After that, spend the most time on your specific aims. I would periodically keep opening my specific aims, continue to read it. A couple good writing tips that you're gonna want. Um, I think, so again, I don't know the best formula. These are things that I try to do. Take them or leave them. I think short sentences, our best. Never ever try to run on sentences. I always perpetually look through all my documents and try to make every sentence as short as possible. This is where it differs from like artistic writing, right? Like I'm not trying to be artistic. I'm trying to be clear. I'm trying to not confuse anybody. I don't care if my sentence is, Jim is a boy. Like, I try, like, as you can, if you can understand it, then I've written it well. That's my, that's my heuristic. So I think short sentences are good. Um, and they'll also tell you this for business writing. So grants, business writing. And again, if you're kind of a person like, I don't really know how to like artistically write. I don't know how, what makes a good sentence. Short, just make it short. Let's see. A list of other writing tips. Can't find them right now. Um, I think I think graphics are really important, which is why I teach my entire scientific illustration class. Which is the whole entire premise is like, how can you construct figures that make people easily able to understand your scientific principles? That's why I teach a whole class on that. I think it's important. I've gotten hit and I, like I've gotten mixed reviews. I've submitted a grant that I thought was completely beautiful and one of the reviewers sent, said, I wish they would have spent less time on the figures and more time explaining me the details of the experiments. So like, you can never make everybody happy. And on that same grant, I got another reviewer who said, this is the most beautiful grant I've ever seen. This is fantastic. So like, there's never a way around it, but I, I think graphics are good. From my perspective as a reviewer, I want to see good graphics that simplify the concepts. Reading 25 pages of text is just a nightmare. So, why, don't, why don't they start like this machine, like machine, machine grading it? learning to basically pick out the best nominee? I think they actually are doing that, but I don't know if that makes them more confident in the process. Uh, um, it's really hard for me to believe that a machine can review a grant 
in a quality way and like understand the science. At the same time, it's also really hard for me to believe that any other human can actually like do it. Um, especially when you give them a list of 25 grants. People have argued that. People have argued essentially like um, NIH reform. One of the reforms would be, okay, you start the process by human review. And humans essentially, their task is essentially like, okay, just sort these grants into top 50% and the lower 50%. From there, roll the dice and see who gets it. People have literally argued for that and argued that it would generate better outcomes. Um, it hasn't happened yet, but there are some people who want that. And I, I actually think that'd be a good thing because it would at least eliminate the human bias factor in them trying to think about like what, what, what are good grants. Okay. Um, a couple of things on the research strategy. S tips on that. I'm almost done here. So just hang in there. Uh, a couple strategies on this is a good way to think about this is um, prevent defense. Like you just don't want holes. You do not want to like let people something that they can, uh, anything that a reviewer can kind of like latch onto or grab onto, they will attack you for. So you want like minimal, as minimal content as you can while giving them everything they need um, and not exposing any holes. Now, this is a catch 22 because if there's an obvious hole and you don't talk about it and you don't say like, this is an obvious hole, they call these pitfalls. This is an obvious pitfall. Here's how I'm gonna deal with that pitfall. You definitely wanna do that, but you don't wanna go out of your way to like reveal um, things that maybe only you would know, okay? Because then you're just giving themselves a hole to, or a scab to pick at. And again, like I haven't figured out the perfect formula for that. You guys are gonna also have to have documents that are called mentorship plans. Usually in fellowships, you have to have a mentorship plan, which is where you like write an essay, like here's a PI I'm gonna be working with, here's why I fit into that person's lab. These are, these are tough to write. I've had a mix of results with these. Um, I don't have a formula for them, but that's what they are. Know that you're gonna to have to write mentorship plans. There's oftentimes, here's another thing that nobody will tell you is there's often extra stuff that other people do that's not part of the rubric. Sometimes you can get away with that, sometimes you can't. So at the NIH, there's what are called letters of support. Letters of support are not required for any grant. And yet if you submit any grant without letters of support, the first thing reviewers will say is, there's no letters of support here. And you're like, well, duh, like it doesn't require them. It doesn't matter to the panelists. So what I'm saying is there's usually like extra stuff that goes with each grant. So if you can find somebody who has gotten that grant, you can talk to them. You can say, hey, like, do you have any tips? Like, what, what did your grant look like? Did you include anything extra? What'd you do? Sometimes things like letters of support are important and you can include in theory, like as many of these as possible. So like I've submitted, a, I've submitted one grant where I've had no letters of support. And they said, there's no letters of support. And then I submitted one grant where there were three letters of support. And they said, there's not enough letters of support. So like, again, it's kind of like, it's crazy like that. Like you can go the extra mile. And, and these things might be like, so if you get like six letters, you might get one letter from like a statistician that can say like, oh, I can help them with statistics. You might get one letter from like, maybe somebody who knows like molecular biology and they can be like, oh, I can help them with molecular biology. You might get one letter from like an ecologist and you can say like, oh, this ecologist is gonna help me if I have problems with that. You might get one letter from like a computer programmer who's like, if there's any bioinformatics issues, I can help them. Stuff like this. The idea is you, you suggest to them that you have this robust network of people that if you ever encounter a problem, you got people to go to. That's kind of like, I've even, I even got a letter from um, Senator Doug Jones. I got a letter from Senator Doug Jones. And he was like, oh, I like this proposal. I support this proposal. 
And I was like, oh, this is, this is kind of cool. Like, this will help. And then the reviewer sent back the grant and they said, this is stupid. I don't understand why Doug Jones is on this. So it's like, again, you can like shoot yourself in the foot um, by doing this, but also like, it's kind of like unwritten rule. You kind of like need these things. So it's a hit or miss. It depends on what the reviewers want. Okay, so that's kind of, that's kind of like the spiel. Um, in the research strategy, the last thing I'll say in the research strategy, you really want to go into the details of like the methodology. It's almost like writing a protocol, like or a methods section. You're literally gonna say the things, the things that you're gonna be writing are the things that I put on that, on that, um, sheet that I gave you guys where it says like all things considered, you're gonna be talking about your plasmids, you're gonna be talking about your backbones, your selection cassettes, your positive and negative controls, your organisms, your strains, all of those details are super important in the research strategy. And if you don't include those details, they'll say you didn't put enough details. Um, that's kind of it, anybody have any questions? You really just kind of have to do it um, hardest part is finding one and downloading instructions. So start there. So the thing that you want us to turn in 